This is a 2016 Ariel Atom, and it is undoubtedly one of the most ridiculous road cars you can buy. Now, when you look at it, it doesn't look like a road car. It looks like a race car or maybe a big go-kart, the big brother of something you would drive at one of those indoor go-karting places where one guy goes every weekend and takes it way too seriously. But it is a road car, and today I'm going to review it. I've borrowed this Ariel Atom from CNC Motors, which is an exotic car dealership here in Southern California that has an amazing inventory of amazing cars from multi-million dollar exotics to old cars to weird stuff like this. They really have one of the most incredible showrooms of any dealership anywhere, and you can check them out by clicking the link in the description below. So let's talk Atom. Now, the Atom first came out nearly 20 years ago, which is hard to believe, and even the very earliest ones were insane right off the bat. They did 0-60 to 60 in around 3 seconds. The Atom first came to the United States in about 2005, and since then, it's been offered in various different evolutions with various different engines and varying states of tune. This Atom is a 2016 model called the Atom 3 and it's built in Virginia by a company called TMI Auto Tech using the engine from a Honda Civic Si. That means it makes around 220 horsepower, which doesn't sound like all that much, but here's the thing, it weighs only 1,350 pounds. That means it does 0 to 60 in about 2.9 seconds, which is hypercar territory. The only difference is, you know, you don't get a roof or doors. And today I'm going to show you what else you don't get or what you do get. I'm going to take you on a tour of the Atom and I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Atom, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Atom by simply getting in, which is harder than you might think because it has no doors. Instead, it has these big black tubes going down the side that provide structural rigidity for the body, and they don't open to make the car as stiff as possible, so you have to climb over them, which I will do in a second. But first, a little note about climbing into an Atom. When you do, your first instinct is to put your hand on the windshield. But because this is just sort of an exposed piece of glass, if you do that and then put weight on it, you could break the windshield. So you're not supposed to put your hand on the windshield when you climb into the car. But even though that makes getting into the Atom more difficult, there are two things you can do to make the process easier. One is you can just step on the seat. The seat is not made of some finely crafted leather with beautiful, perfect stitching. Instead, it's this fabric designed to save as much weight as possible. So if you want, you climb right in and you can just stand here and that won't really cause any problems. The other thing you can do to make it easier to get into the Atom, you can remove the steering wheel. You pull this little yellow backing on the steering wheel and then it comes right off. And you can pull the wheel out. You have it right here. And that makes it really easy to get your body in and get your knees under the gauge cluster. And now you're in the Atom. And once you're in this position of the Atom, of course, it's time to put the steering wheel back on, fire up the car and get going, except there's a problem. You see, if you've already gotten into this position and you haven't already begun the ignition process, then you're screwed. That's because the first step of the ignition process is outside the car. There's a little kill switch in front, directly in front of the windshield, and you stick on this little red plastic piece and turn it, and that turns on the battery. When it's turned the opposite direction, the car is completely off, the battery is disconnected, and you can't possibly start it. Now, once you've turned on the car with that little red tool, there's no key to start it. So basically, that kill switch is your key. And that's how you know you're in a hardcore car, when the battery cutoff tool is the only key that you have. But anyway, once you've turned that on, then you can get inside the car and complete the remainder of the ignition process. 
which is rather unusual. The first thing you do, there's this little black fob you can see mounted underneath the dashboard. You have to kind of wave it in the right spot and that disables the immobilizer. And you really do have to do that before you can start the car. Then there's a little switch behind the steering wheel and you flip that into the on position. And then once you've done that, there's a little black button to the left of the steering wheel, unlabeled, you press that and that turns on the ignition in the Atom. So really it is a four step process, no key, but it's not like anybody trying to steal this car would ever be able to figure out how to do that stuff. Unless of course, they've seen this video. Now moving on from the simple act of getting in the Atom and starting it, the rest of the controls in here are just as ridiculous as the ignition process was. I'm gonna start with the turn signals. They're over to the left of the steering wheel, not a stalk coming out from the steering column, but instead a little switch marked L and R. You just push it whichever direction turn signal you wanna turn on, and then it turns on. Now you see switches like that occasionally in motorcycles and ATVs, but it's ridiculous to see it in a four wheeled like license plated car, but that's what it has and they don't cancel. So once you turn on the signal, you better remember to turn it off. Otherwise it'll just stay on like you're a grandmother driving in the left lane with your blinker on for miles. But since that turn signal switch only allows you to choose between left and right turn signals, you might be wondering how do you turn them both on at once? How do you turn on the hazard lights? Well, that's an interesting one. That's over to the right in this gauge cluster area and it is a big red rubber button. You kind of can see as I push it around, it is <laughs> rubber and ridiculous looking, but if you push it really hard, that will turn on the hazard lights and then both turn signals are active at once. Now next up, moving on to some of the other controls in this gauge cluster area. If you go back over to the left, you will see there is another unlabeled black button, exactly identical to the ignition, except this one is the horn. <laughs> So you better remember which is which when you're driving along. You push that and the horn activates. And in case you want to know what the horn sounds like in an aerial atom, here you go. Now next up, even more controls over here. To the right of the steering wheel in this gauge cluster, you have a little dial that turns on the headlights. You can see you twist it and then you have three different settings, zero, one, two, or three, depending on how much headlight you want. Right below that, you have another little dial that's either zero or one, not labeled, so it's kind of hard to figure out what that is. That is the rear fog light. So if you're driving this thing in the rain or in heavy fog and you don't want to get hit from behind, you turn that on and it will enhance the ability of other drivers drivers to see you on the road. Now next up, moving up from there onto the dashboard itself, you have a little dial for the windshield wipers. That one's pretty self-explanatory. You turn it and the wiper, singular actually, turns on and starts wiping across the windshield. To the left of that, you have another button. That's the windshield washer. There's no fluid in this car right now, so you press that and you can hear the windshield washer doing its thing in case you need to wash the windshield. Of course, you could also just, you know, like have a bucket and reach out and just wash it yourself which might be more effective. Not too many cars where you have the option to do either one. Now below the windshield wiper controls, you can see there's another dial there. That actually isn't a dial. Instead, you pull that off and that is your cigarette lighter outlet. So if you wanna plug in a phone charger or a track telemetry situation, you can do that right there. Now below all that stuff in the middle, you have a backup camera. This backup camera has been installed aftermarket, obviously to improve rear visibility. And frankly, it's kind of nice to have it because this car doesn't even have a rear view mirror, let alone a factory backup camera. So that finally allows you to see what's behind you, which is nice because as you can tell, rear visibility, not really all that great. But anyway, moving back to the gauge cluster, there are four more buttons in here. These are all a little bit more cryptic than the buttons we've already talked about. You have one on the left that says MNU. That means menu. I'm not sure why they didn't just get that extra E on there, but they didn't. Anyway, if you press that, it turns on or off the center screen display in case you want it off so you're not distracted while you're driving. If you have it on, you can see it shows your current RPM, both digitally and in like an RPM meter. It also shows your current speed, your mileage, and your trip odometer, pretty standard gauge cluster stuff. Now over on the right of that screen, you have a button marked A. If you press that, it resets the trip odometer. Push it and the odometer resets right away. But you also have two other buttons in there. On the right, there's one marked SEL, and on the left, there's one marked V. I've pressed those, I've played with them. I have no idea what they do. Something, surely, 
but nothing I can figure out. Now next up, beyond all the controls, there are a few other interesting quirks and features in the Atom, starting with the parking brake. Now that's not mounted in the middle like in most other cars, instead it's over on the left, and when you pull it up it stays up. Now in cars with doors this would be a problem because then you'd like trip over it when you're trying to get out, but in the Atom there are no doors, so it works perfectly. Good place for the parking brake. Now in the middle, obviously, you have the gear selector. This has a traditional manual transmission. You can go through the gears, except it doesn't tell you where any of the gears actually are. You just have to kind of figure it out. Obviously, first is up and to the left, but this becomes a problem if, for example, you're going for reverse, or is it sixth? You're not really sure. <laughs> it would be nice to have a label on there, but there is no label, and I'm sure it makes the car two tenths of an ounce lighter. Now, below the dashboard in an Atom is another interesting place to look because everything down there is exposed. Rather than putting on trim pieces and panels that would add weight, they just leave it. So you can see the steering shaft down there, you can see what it connects to, you can see the pedals and all the housings. Everything down there is completely exposed, no additional panels or trim or other items. They don't care about that stuff, they just want to make the lightest, simplest, fastest car possible. And on that note, let's talk about the seats. This car has some nice grippy sport seats like you'd want. As I mentioned, it has a specific fabric designed to save weight and probably also to keep you from sliding around. There's no hand-stitched leather here. It is worth noting, however, that the passenger seat has a pillow on it. You can remove the pillow or keep it on in case your passenger wants to sit up a little higher. Of course, you could also move the pillow to the driver's seat in case you can't reach the pedals or see high enough, although this thing is so small, I suspect there's little chance of that happening. And speaking of the seats, it's worth noting that the Atom comes with race-style seat belts. These are not six-point belts that all buckle into one center buckle. Instead, they buckle at your lap like normal seat belts, but they do go both over your shoulder like you'd expect a seat belt in kind of a racing car, which fits in with the ethos of the Atom. And finally, one other interesting Atom item worth noting on the inside would be the mirrors. There are two rear view wing mirrors in the Atom, and of course they are not power adjustable. Instead, you manually put them in exactly the position you want. It's also worth noting they are unbelievably small. Probably the single smallest wing mirrors I have ever seen in any car I have ever tested they're just ridiculously small. We'll see how they do for visibility in a minute when I get this out on the road. And next up, we move on to the outside of the Atom. And the first thing you notice when you look at an Atom is frankly that it looks like a race car. I'm serious, it really looks like an open wheel race car. This is the closest looking thing to like an Indy car that you will ever see with a license plate driving along on the road. It's really quite incredible. Now, two of the main things that contribute to that are this front spoiler up front. You can see this big spoiler going across the nose of the Atom. And in back, you have another big spoiler high up going across the bag, just like an Indy car or a Formula One car. Those really, really make it look race car-ish. Now, it's worth noting that those spoilers are not standard on every Atom, but this one has them as options to make it especially race car-like and track focused. Now next I want to focus more on some of the Adam's most interesting exterior quirks and features and I'm going to start up front specifically with this panel here. You'll notice at the top it has a couple of little screws with hoops kind of keeping it in place. If you unscrew those hoop screws, you take them out, you can pull this panel off and it reveals a tiny storage area underneath. So this car is not completely impractical, just very, very impractical. There is some storage. Now, next to that little panel, you can see the suspension. The Atom has inboard suspension. Most cars have their suspension right at the wheel. This thing moves it in. The advantage there is packaging. By moving it in, you can keep it within the body and make the car more aerodynamic and make the whole wheel area a little bit smaller. So that's exactly what they've done here. One other interesting item in the front of the Atom is the headlights which are mounted on a post coming off of the structural bit that holds the wheel and tire on the car. Now you can see this post is a little bit flimsy. You can kind of shake it if you want. And you can also see these headlights are incredibly small. Now, like I showed you before, you have three different types of headlight on that little switch inside. If you turn it to one, some very dim parking lights come on. Two is the regular headlights. And then three is the high beams. 
and that's what the headlights look when they're on and he had a pretty small. Smaller still though are the turn signals. You put those on and look how tiny they are in this little post. They are absolutely ridiculous turn signals, but they're there and they pretty much have to be if you actually want to drive this thing on the road legally. And finally, we move around to the back of the Atom, which has a couple of interesting quirks and features of its own. Starting with the lighting back here, there is a brake light and a turn signal integrated into the same little circle, somehow even smaller than what you get up front. This stuff is barely visible back here, but it is here satisfying whatever regulations are necessary to bring this on the road. Now, the other interesting thing back here is how accessible the engine is. Once again, you have these little screws with hoops. You can just turn them all and easily access basically any part of the engine. But it is worth noting that even with the little pieces of bodywork in place, you can pretty much access all of the engine. If you come around to the back, there's not much covering any part of the engine and you really have good access in this car. Again, not much bodywork designed to save weight and keep it simple. And the final interesting item in the back of the Atom, if you look back here, one of the first things you'll notice is there's a license plate on this car. And I've mentioned many times, this thing is street legal. You can drive it on the road. So let's talk about how that happens. Even here in regulation heavy California, which is not always the most friendly to car enthusiasts, there's an exemption for kit cars that allows a certain number of kit cars to be registered every year on a first come first serve basis. And this is one of those cars that was registered as a kit car. And so even here in California, this thing can be driven around completely legally. I'm not sure it's entirely legal in all states. Some may have differing regulations about a vehicle like this, but at least in some states and probably most states, you can put a license plate on this and drive it around just like it's a Toyota Camry, which it very much isn't. And so those are the quirks and features of the Ariel Atom 3. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Atom. I hope you can hear me. There's a lot of wind going on. It doesn't feel quite as go-karty as I thought. It feels a little more substantial than that. You're not that low. I've definitely been in exotic cars where you sit lower than this, but you are really open, really exposed. highway drive I've ever had in any car. A couple of thoughts. One, it is so loud. It is definitely loud under acceleration. You can't hear a thing. It's so, so excessively loud. I don't want to accelerate hard ever again in this car. You just fe feel it against your eardrum. It's excessive. Number two, you do feel very exposed, very open, although not as exposed and open as I was thinking you would. These bars down the side actually do a decent job of making you feel a little protected. It's just this thing is excessive. I mean, you get a sense of what race car drivers go through. It takes a lot. It's a lot of effort. Woo! Oh! The shaking! The camera is shaking out of place. That's happening more on the windshield because it's not supported. I don't feel that much shaking. It's actually relatively stable for the type of car that it is. So that shaking isn't as big of a problem as you might think. Honestly, I want to go fast, but it's easier, especially with the noise, to just sit in a lane in a high gear and chill. This is not a highway car. I will say though, if you were on a racetrack, it would be pretty amazing. It changes directions at ridiculous pace. The steering, no power steering. And I mean, it's all right here. It's so insanely connected to the car itself uh, at a level that's really, really, really hard to beat. Mostly though, I just find this car tiring. It's fun, it's amazing, it's exhilarating, but you better really, really, really wanna put up with it because it's a lot. It's uncomfortable, it's hot, it's tight, it's loud. 
it's everything that a track car probably should be, but it's nothing that you want on the road. And I am incredibly surprised at how tired I am right now in this thing. And so that's the Ariel Atom 3. This isn't a car so much as it's an experience. And effectively, it's like a super bike on four wheels. A car that is so insane, it's designed for people who want even their car to feel like a wild and crazy motorcycle. This isn't like basically anything else that's street legal, but it is a total thrill, and I'm glad I got to check it out. And now it's time to give the Atom a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Atom doesn't have much styling, but I do appreciate the race car look, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Acceleration 0 to 60 is 2.9 seconds, and it gets a 10 out of 10. Handling is incredibly sharp, no surprise, and it gets a 10 out of 10. Fun factor is a bit lower, only because while the car is fun to drive, it's also incredibly exhausting, which limits the experience a bit, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Cool factor is high, this is so cool, a go-kart for the road, but because it doesn't have your typical ultra-cool brand name, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Everyone will always be asking what it is. That limits things a bit, and it gets an 8 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 42 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It has basically none, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Comfort is really egregiously bad, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Quality is okay. It doesn't have nice luxuries, but it is well built with a reliable engine, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is hilariously low, and it easily earns a 1 out of 10. Finally, value, and I think it depends on your perspective. These sell for 60 or 70,000 thousand dollars or more and I think that's a ton of money for something that makes you uncomfortable and deaf but if you put the performance numbers next to exotic cars it's an amazing value it goes in the middle and it earns a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 15 out of 50 added up in the Doug score is 57 out of 100 which places the Atom here against some other especially focused sports cars I've reviewed the Atom score is hilariously imbalanced with a weekend score that nears a 48 pista or a Huracan performante but a daily score that doesn't even come close to an N.A. Miata, which isn't exactly a luxury car. Such is life if you want something as hardcore as an Ariel Atom.